So our next speakers are uh, Dr. Uh, Del Rosso, who we heard from earlier this morning, and also uh, Dr. Bonnie Aluski from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Dr. Aluski has one of our colleagues working in her lab, actively uh, doing studies. Wendy Cantrell, did Wendy make it? No. No, okay. So, uh, Okay. I'm first. Good morning, everybody. I'm Bonnie Aluski from Birmingham, Alabama, not Michigan. And we're going to talk, uh, Jim and I are going to uh, do a little duo here on uh, improving your diagnostic skills, simple office tests. So I'm going to go first, and I'm going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about the diagnosis of onychomycosis. We're going to talk a little bit about what to do in psoriasis. And third, we're going to discuss something that itches scabies. So let's first talk about onychomycosis. So onychomycosis begins as an extension of tinea pedis. Fungi don't just go from the carpet and pull vault into your toenails. They actually first make a home on the bottom of your foot and cause tinea pedis. So the first thing you have to do is look for tinea pedis. And that's exactly why when we look at onychomycosis, the fungus, uh, the abnormality, is in the distal region of the nail, in the region of the um, hyponychium, because the fungus enters here from the bottom of the foot and extends from the distal to the proximal area. And I kind of drew here the amount where the fungus is living happily in a nail. And that patient has distal subungual onychomycosis. And that's important to know because every drug we have to treat onychomycosis is treating this type, distal subungual onychomycosis, also known as distal lateral subungual onychomycosis. And this, these are more slides showing distal or distal lateral subungual onychomycosis. Again, you will see the onycholysis in the distal region of the nail. You will see subungual hyperkeratosis, maybe a yellow color, uh, maybe a brown color, and these patients have uh, generally have or had tinea pedis. This is another patient, also with distal onycholysis, as is this patient. And this is pretty white, and that actually is the beginning of a fungal abscess, also known as dermatophytoma, uh, which is a conglomeration of fungi kind of living together happily. But it's a sign that it's going to be hard to treat. So. When you go to figure out how to uh, diagnose the patient, the first thing you need to do is look for tinea pedis. So look in the toe web and look at the bottom of the feet. If they don't have tinea pedis, they probably don't have onychomycosis, with a couple exceptions. Maybe they had tinea pedis and treated it before, that's quite possible, or two, perhaps they had a pedicure and the instruments used to clip the nail were contaminated. So the fungus was inoculated into the nail by contaminated uh, instruments. So that could be one explanation for no tinea pedis without onychomycosis. So the first strategy confirmed tinea pedis. And then you want to do a diagnostic test. And I think doing these diagnostic tests will become more important because we have two new topical drugs for onychomycosis, which I'll talk about this afternoon, efeniconazole and tavoboral. And I think we're going to need to have conclusive proof of infection prior to prescribing these drugs. This may be required by most insurance providers. So you have three things you can do, a KOH, you can do a fungal culture, or you could do nail clippings. So how do you obtain your sample? Well, first thing first, you want to clean the nail with alcohol. And often, I have to add, I clean the nail with soap and water. Now, why do I clean the nail? Because there's bacteria living in the nail, and the bacteria, if you're doing a fungal culture, will overgrow and prevent the growth of a fungus. So you want to remove the bacteria. So clean with alcohol, soap and water, whatever you need. And then you clip the diseased distal part of the nail plate and use a curette to remove the debris from the nail bed. This is the instrument I use to clip the nail. These are, are nail nippers, dual action nail nippers. They're uh, well worth an investment. They're easy to do, even for the thickest of nails. Uh, because of their dual action, you can clip very easily and uh, get your nail specimen. And after you uh, clip the nail off, you will expose the nail bed, and then you can obtain debris, if any, from under the nail bed. And to obtain the debris, I use a small little curette. 
doesn't hurt. You just kind of scrape the nail bed with a curette. If you don't have a little curette, well, you could use a disposable curette. This is a very small one millimeter curette. Or you could use a 15 blade, but you have to be very careful uh, with that, of course. All right, once you obtain your specimen, you then could, if you're planning to do a KOH, put the specimen on a, on a slide, a glass slide, add a cover slip, and then you can add your potassium hydroxide solution. So what KOH does is it dissolves the uh, cell membranes of the host, but it cannot dissolve the cell wall of the hyphae. So eventually, the cell membrane tissue all dies, the cells die, leaving only the hyphae. You do not need to heat your KOH preparation if you're using DMSO. So I do like to buy solutions that contain DMSO. I also like to have solutions that contain Chlorazole Black E because that stains the hyphae a blue-black color, which makes it so much easier to recognize under low power. And then you look under low power, not high power. And this is KOH positive. You see these uh, small little um, hyphae that are septate when you look closely under low power, and these are colored because we used Chlorazole Black E. These are also hyphae, um, much easier to see because here I'm using a fluorescent microscope, something not done in our office, but it was done in my lab. And it's much easier and more specific, but not something we can do. But if you send something to a commercial lab, uh, see if they do use a fluorescent technique called calcofluor. Uh, the positive KOH confirms the presence of a fungus, but not the identity of the fungus. You don't know what it is, you just know that it's there. The fungal culture will identify the organism. As long as you send it to a reliable laboratory, you want to get ample specimen, as I mentioned already, and it may take a, a month or even a little longer to confirm the uh, pathogen. And I usually like to ship it in these derma packs. These should be supplied by the lab you use. You don't have to buy them, but whatever lab you use should supply something for you to send the specimen to them uh, conveniently. And you just put it in the US mail, voila. PAS stain, uh, something easy to do. If you don't have a lab available or you don't have time or the ability to do a KOH, PAS is fine. This provides the same information a KOH does. It tells you the presence or absence of a fungus, but not the identity of the fungus. You clip the distal nail plate with your dual, and dual nail nippers. So in this nail specimen, I would clip the distal nail plate and send that in my formalin filled bottle to the lab with a request uh, to rule out onychomycosis, maybe versus psoriasis. And a dramatopathologist might comment that there's perikeratosis or other features of psoriasis. And some patients may have both, onychomycosis and psoriasis. But that can be very helpful in making a diagnosis of onychomycosis. And this is a positive PAS stain showing hyphae in the nail. Of course, it doesn't tell you what the fungus is. It just tells you that there's fungus there. And also be careful in interpreting this. If the pathologist says there's hyphae, well, I'd say that's good. That's a real diagnosis. You have something that shouldn't be there. But if they say they see spores, I'm not sure often how to interpret it because it may be just contamination. So I would then prefer to get a culture or repeat my test. So to diagnose onychomycosis, this is what I do to treat. If the KOH is positive for hyphae, or if hyphae is seen in PAS stain, so either see hyphae, you know the patient has onychomycosis and you can proceed accordingly. However, if those tests are negative, they still could have onychomycosis, but you missed it. So then a fungal culture, wait for that. If the fungal culture identifies a dermatophyte, you know that's the pathogen. If the KOH is negative and you have a dermatophyte growing, it's the pathogen. But if the KOH is negative and anything else except a dermatophyte grows, so any other fungus or yeast, it's probably a contaminant. That's very important to know. Um, what do you do with this information? Well, if you know that there's a fungus because the PS is positive, you can assume that it's probably a dermatophyte because 90% of the uh, cases of onychomycosis are caused by dramatophytes. 10% are not. So you can assume that the patient has a dramatophyte. So, for example, if you're planning to treat with terbenafin, 
Terbenafin is an anti-dramatified drug. It really doesn't kill candida or non-dramatophytes in the nail. You'll be right 90% of the time. If the patient is not improving, think, well, I wonder if that positive KOH or if the PAS that was positive really was showing me a non-dramatophyte. Now, the good news is that the new topical drugs that, will be coming, that are out now, one is out, one is coming out soon, are effective in most of these non-dramatophyte infections. So they, they're more broad spectrum than uh, oral terbenafin. Or, uh, non-dramatophytes cause white superficial onychomycosis. So if you see this, you know it's probably not a dramatophyte. The nails turn white, and you can take a 15 blade and just scrape off that white color. If the fungus is just attacking the nail plate and kind of eating and making a nice home in the superficial layer of the nail plate. And most of these are caused by non-dramatophytes. I also, when someone comes to you with fingernails, as you see here, I want you to always look at the toenails. So the way to approach a nail is, if they come to you with toenails, you want to look at the fingernails. If someone comes to you with fingernail disease, look at the toenails. Patients who have fingernail dystrophy are unlikely to have onychomycosis of the fingernail unless they have onychomycosis of the toenail. And there have been many, many patients I have seen in my career who have failed terbenafin for fingernail psoriasis. 5% of people with psoriasis have only nail disease and present with onycholysis of the fingernails. They don't have fungus, they have psoriasis. So rule psoriasis out before you blame the fungus. And onycholytic or abnormal fingernails is unlikely to be a dermatophyte. It can be if they have abnormal toenails and they have dermatophyte onychomycosis. So now let's move into treating nail psoriasis. There's many things we can do. Time is limited, so I'm gonna concentrate on one thing. You can use topical corticosteroids, you can use topical retinoids, topical vitamin D analogs, all good. Some patients may be on a biologic, and I find that the biologics work in the nails to the same extent as in the skin. Uh, you can use an oral drug like acetretin in people who can take that drug, women who are not of childbearing potential. I do that for six months. But what do you do for these nails? You see a thick, grungy toenail or fingernail. The patient's very distressed by it. You've ruled out a fungus. You know that a topical, and topical drug is not gonna penetrate that. It's not gonna help them. So what do you do? Well, what I'm gonna recommend to consider is intralesional injection. I do this all the time. It's a little difficult to initiate this because you have to explain to the patient what they're getting into. Um, and often you do one nail and say, let's how it does, we'll just do one nail. Um, you can use ethyl chloride for anesthesia. Just have your nurse spray ethyl chloride as you're ready to go. I like to clean the nail really good with alcohol, hippocleanse, betadine, whatever you want, so it's, it's fairly, fairly sterile. And this nail is not really that abnormal, but I'm using it just to demonstrate this. So I inject in two spots, and I use trimcinolone diluted with lidocaine, no epi. And the final concentration is, is uh, five milligrams per ml. So you could take one cc of 10 milligrams of Kenalog per ml and one cc of, of uh, lidocaine no epi and you'll have five milligrams per ml. And uh, I like to use no epi so it diffuses more. I think the epi will keep it exactly where you put it so I want it to diffuse. So essentially you're doing almost a modified block. Uh, I, where the proximal nail fold and the lateral nail fold meet, I do my first injection, and I just make a tiny bleb. And then I pause and I talk to the patient. And that's numbing, by the way. And then I put my needle in that little bleb, like a mosquito bite, and just put it sideways so I go across into the posterior nail fold. And it shouldn't hurt too much because you numb the entry. You can then do another injection on the contralateral side right there and then put your needle in and go also on the base of the nail, the proximal nail fold. And that will inject the nail matrix. If they have nail plate disease, nail plate is made by the matrix. So by injecting the matrix, the nail will grow out. And actually, it works quite well. And patients are quite happy. If they have a lot of nail bed disease, onycholysis, uh, subungual debris, then you might take your needle and inject it then down parallel to the nail plate down into the lateral nail folds on both sides. And that will diffuse under the nail bed. 
And if you do your two main injections on each side of the nail unit, on the right and the left side of the uh, nail plate in the area where the lateral nail fold intersects with the proximal nail fold first and wait, you've essentially done a modified digital block and everything else you do should not hurt. And I do this every two to three months and uh, maybe just once and that's enough to get started. This is a typical patient before and after, very happy. You know, this patient was a concert violinist. They were having a lot of trouble and I think playing the violin kebnerized their fingers and that's one reason they were getting fingernail uh, dystrophy. Last but not least, a technique we should think about is how to diagnose scabies. Uh, remember that people with scabies itch, mostly at night, so, and look for a rash often um, on the wrists, in the axilla, the umbilicus, the genital area, the medial foot. In infants, they may present with infantile acropustulosis. Uh, some people, especially some of the elderly, don't have much of a rash. But when you have the rash, it can be very helpful. You can diagnose it by doing a skin biopsy if you want. Scabies prep, dermoscopy can be helpful. And of course, your clinical suspicion. And I teach my residents, if you think of scabies enough, you might want to treat empirically. It won't hurt. I, I, I do not know of a dermatologist who can say that I've never missed scabies, because we've all missed scabies. You know, I've seen the chairman of departments come in and miss scabies, because it depends on what the patient had when you saw them. You know, everybody presents at different times in their, in their uh, disease, and they may not have had the classic presentation, so people miss this diagnosis. So if you consider a treat, I tend to treat orally with ivermectin. It's not messy, it's clean, and uh, it's easy to do. But a couple pearls I want to give is the dermatoscope. You're supposed to see a jet plane-like appearance if you look in the burrow. And uh, there it is, and there it is, a jet plane, tiny little dot in the burrow. And that's what you'd want to grab. If you um, uh, want to get a specimen, you, grab, you scrape some stuff in the areas of the infection, you wipe it with your 15 blade on the glass slide, you cover, put a cover slip. You can use oil or KOH, examine under low power, and if you're lucky, you'll see Mr. Mite here. Um, and on that note, itchy rash, think scabies. I will now turn the podium to Dr. Del Rosso. Thanks, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot, Bonnie. One of the things I want to point out about uh, patients that have scabies, the majority of the lesions that you're looking at that they keep trying to show you when you're trying to examine them for the right type of lesion uh, to look at are there, there are no mites there. There are no eggs there. There are no skibola. Everybody know what skibola are? It's the feces of the mite uh, that you're going to find. So you're looking for these little keratotic papules. They're often linear. And if you just scrape the surface of them, you're not going to get anything. You have to get into the tunnel. So you really have to excavate that portion of it. And you're always going to draw a little bit of blood. And so that's how you're going to be able to find it. So you'll see those. You have to look over the patients. They're not always in the classic areas. So we're going to move on and talk about methods of biopsy, which I think are very important. And I'll frame this by saying, I think it was about three years ago, uh, our group had a managed care contract with an HMO. We were the only ones that had it. And we have several different clinics. We have dermatologists and we have physician assistants working with us in the practice. And we were challenged by this healthcare plan, by the plastic surgeon that was on the plan, which was fine. Okay, we're open for a challenge. Let us know what it's about. And it had to do with the method of biopsy for pigmented lesions. And it was actually directed primarily against the physician assistants in the practice. So I was asked by the group to go in and see what was going on. So when I got there, I'm sitting there, there's the plastic surgeon, the medical director, and some of their other consultants as a surgeon. Uh, I was the only dermatologist there with one of our administrators. Uh, and the medical director just got in my face. He's showing me all these things that we have printed in dermatology on how the biopsy should be done, guidelines that you should have down into fat, uh, procedures taken down into fat, and that these were, weren't taken deep, uh, deep enough. So I said, well, give me a chance. We'll go back and look at it. So I went and I looked at all the slides. And fortunately, in all the cases, because the uh, plastic surgeon brought cases, I was able to see at least on what were truly saucerizations, uh, excisions, not shaves, and I'll go over that distinction in a minute, that 
at least on that one view, okay, that they were clear. So I felt comfortable that the people in our practice were getting around the lesions and getting deep enough for the purposes of a biopsy. But it was very different than what our literature says. If you look at our literature, it says you should be going down into fat. And that's not what we do the majority of the time. So I went back and I said to the plastic surgeon, I said, well, if you would like, you're making a judgment against what happened without seeing the initial lesion. So if you'd like, we'll refer all of them to you. Now keep in mind, they're capitation patients, right? So I, I reckon, we'll let you see them all and you decide how you wanna do the biopsy if you don't think we're doing it correctly. And the fact of the matter is, is our literature really didn't represent, and it's only recently that the new guidelines recognize that you can utilize methods of saucerization and not necessarily go down into fat. But the portion that we don't really discuss is depth. We talk about margins around lesions, but we don't have a lot of discussion about depth. So it was fine. We were able to uh, convince them that everything was OK. I went back to our group and met with the group, and I pulled out the charts. And I said, it's only fair that we look at what we're doing. And I saw lesions were not being described, not only by the physician assistants, but also by the dermatologists. Sizes weren't being written down. And I said, we need to clean up our own house too in terms of how we're describing lesions. Because we're talking about lesions that could potentially be a melanoma or something that's very atypical. So I think the methods of biopsy and the terminology become very, very important. So we have a few different methods where we can biopsy lesions. I'm gonna focus on pigmented lesions, but we have to understand what these are. And this is my own terminology how I conceptualize it and how I discussed it with the group. We have a punch biopsy, which is a cylinder, which is for full thickness at whatever, whatever width you're selecting. And so if you wanna be looking at the full thickness, that's where a punch biopsy would come into play. I think it's often mentioned uh, and utilized when you don't necessarily need a punch biopsy. And there's other times where it would be more beneficial to get a punch biopsy. But it's a full thickness biopsy, epidermis, dermis and subcutaneous fat. But unless you're completely getting around a lesion, circumferentially, you're taking just a portion of a bigger lesion typically. And then there's a shave biopsy. To me, when I shave, I don't cut into my skin. And I wouldn't imagine people here that shave their legs or their armpits don't cut into their skin. Shave is parallel to the skin, it does not go into the dermis. It's to get off a superficial uh, uh, seborrheic keratosis or an intradermal nevus where you're just trying to go across the skin, the surface of the skin, but you know you're not gonna get out the dermal portion. You're not suspecting that you have a malignancy or an atypical lesion. So I don't like when the term shave is used for anything else other than that. Because if you're going down into the dermis, you're tangentially going into the skin, you're going below the surface, and if you're looking at pigmented lesions, you have to get part of the dermis in order for the pathologist to really get a good view of what's going on and try to get the breadth of the lesion as much as possible. So I like to differentiate shave and saucerization. But when you have a lesion that you're suspecting is a melanoma, you're looking at it and you're clearly expecting that it's a melanoma, it's recommended that you utilize an excisional biopsy for the purpose of diagnosis and getting a two to three millimeters, people talk about different margins around it of normal skin, and then try to remove that entire lesion down into fat. But very often, that's not the situation. Very often, and you're all in this situation, and you all have people you're reporting back to, if you're dealing with the face or areas that may be cosmetically sensitive, you're trying not to scar the patient, but you have to get into dermis. So scar is always a consequence. The question is, how deep do you need to go? So what I brought back to that particular group is number one, I don't wanna hear about punch biopsy for a portion of a pigmented lesion or for looking at the margin evaluation unless you're going very, very wide around the lesion, which what would be the sense of that? You just might as well do a fusiform excision. So punch biopsies are not very good for determining margins in most cases. And there's reasons for that. You're only taking a portion of a lesion, usually in a small cylinder. So let's say you're taking a four to five millimeter punch biopsy. The lesion may be three, four millimeters or five millimeters. And you're just trying to go a millimeter or so beyond that. 
So when you look at what, what's actually happening, in this situation, when the pathologist, uh, when the tech cuts it and you're only looking at those sections of that entire lesion, which is a very small portion, it's clear. Okay, what they're telling you is clear happens to be clear. But if you're a little bit off center, it may look like it's clear, but the margin's involved. Or if you're dealing with a malignancy, which by definition goes in different directions to different degrees, because it's random, it may look like you're clear when you're not clear. The other thing about punches that become very important is if you're looking at a portion of a lesion, you have to recognize, and I'll show you that in a minute, but if, if you're punching something, you want to pull the tissue, you want to, want to predict your line of closure, and you want to pull the tissue perpendicular to that, because when it recoils, it's not going to be round. It's going to turn into more of an ellipse. So if you're at a line where you want to close into, you want to pull perpendicular to that. But let's look at a punch biopsy pitfall. Here's a larger lesion, and I've seen patients come in, have congenital nevi or atypical nevi punch biopsied. And Tim Johnson from Michigan has written a lot about this. You're taking a portion of the lesion, okay, and you're leaving the rest behind, and you're trying to make a determination about that entire lesion. What happens if you only take the wrong portion? You may be giving the pathologist a portion that under diagnosis, where they're not seeing the features of melanoma. They may call it mildly atypical, or they may call it benign, depending on what you're taking. And that's been reported multiple times. You want to get around the entire lesion if you're suspecting that it might be a melanoma to give the pathologist the entire area. Now the question is, how deep do you go? And you have to make the call. Here's a patient that has a classic dermal nevus. It's been there for years. They get smart enough to tell you it itches because when they've come in to other dermatologists, they tell them it's cosmetic because it's not bothering them or it's not changing. So they learn the rules. They tell you it may have grown and it itches sometimes. It's painful sometimes. And you know that you're not necessarily going to be removing this entire lesion. You're not suspecting malignancy, so you're gonna go even with the skin. If you really suspect that it might be a malignancy, then you have to go deeper within the skin. So now if you have a lesion like this, where it tends to be more atypical, but it's macular, where you know you're not gonna have a lot of significant depth, then it's reasonable to do a saucerization and you need to go down into reticular dermis, okay? If you have a lesion that has more depth or is more palpable, then you have to be concerned more about the depth that you're going because you don't want to shave through the depth of that lesion. So a blue nevus, you're obviously going to need to go deeper. Here it's a spitz nevus, potentially. You're, you obviously need to go deeper. So you're in the best position to judge based on the clinical presentation of that lesion but always think about the depth and getting the entire lesion if you can. So uh, if you can diagnose better, then you can treat better. So that's really the goal of what we're trying to do here. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay.